Good evening. How is everyone? I'm so proud of myself that I didn't say good morning. I was sitting down there, I was saying, don't say good morning. Don't say good morning. Uh, my name is Bronson. If you're, if you're new to our church, this is not a normal service for us. This is our Good Friday celebration. And we're celebrating the day that, that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, a man in the Middle East, was tried for crimes he did not commit, was scourged and beaten, he was spit on, he was marched up a hill, and he was nailed to a tree. And, and tonight what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of rest in that tension. This is not a normal service for us, but we're just going to kind of enter in and, and, and feel the suffering, feel the tension of, of what he went through. And so these past couple of weeks, we, we've been doing a bunch, a couple of series. So we started the year with an essential series, and we talked about if we want to become like Jesus, we have to do the things that Jesus did, right? And so we looked at different practices that God would have us do. And then we started to look at it and say, okay, who was Jesus? We talked about Jesus as the good shepherd. We talked about Jesus as the perfect king, the perfect priest, the perfect prophet. And then we got into a series where we looked at why they killed Jesus, okay? It's important because sometimes we look at Jesus and it's like Jesus uh, was blonde hair, blue eyed, never hurt anybody, right? Why do we kill Jesus? And so we talked about that. And then uh, this past weekend, we went through uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus. And when, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and basically what he was doing is he was confronting the religious leaders of the day, and he was forcing their hand. And so here we are on Friday, and this is the culmination of all the things that Jesus has done. And so I've got Carly here. She, she's going to read the scripture here in a second. But, but I want to say this. Good Friday tells us a number of things, but a question for you, I just want to frame for you as we get going. Have you been suffering, like presently in your life, or, or maybe a season past or a time in your life, and you ask the question, where is God in my suffering? Where is God in my pain? Where is God in my, my challenge? Good Friday tells us this, that we have a king who knows how it feels to grieve and suffer and can relate to us in our pain and suffering. Isaiah 53, 3 says this. It says, he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces as he was despised and we esteemed him not. So let's read this, uh, Matthew 27, 45 through 56. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. Rocks split apart and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us and God, all that you're doing. God, I pray this morning that you'd speak to us, God, that you'd be with us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Come on, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, it's interesting. As you go to Good Friday and, and you look at the cross, the cross has become a ubiquitous symbol in our world, right? Right? What is the cross? The cross is something we get tattooed on ourselves when we're in our rebellious stage. Anybody in here brave enough to raise their hand? Come on, Bible verse. Anybody do that? Spiritual symbols. Okay, that was me. Uh, maybe the cross is a trinket that, that you wear on a bracelet, or maybe it's something that you wear around your neck, but it's, it's everywhere. And, and what I believe is that it, it's really lost its meaning. There, there's a clip here. Has anybody watched the show Arrested Development? I don't pastorally 
recommend this show, but here we go. Here's a little clip from this. George Michael, I don't think you should be going on this promised land thing. What? Why, is this because I missed school? No. You no. didn't miss school for that? And that's when Maybe decided to become a devout Christian. Do you guys know where I could get one of those gold necklaces with a T on it? That's a cross. A cross from where? Um, it, it's not a... Okay. <laughs> It's, it's a joke, but isn't it such good cultural commentary? Like, the cross is everywhere, but I think largely our culture has totally forgot what it means. Like, we, we don't see the weight of it. The cross was a murder device, okay? This was a device of execution by the Roman Empire. This was uh, a one-to-one -to, -one to the electric chair, right? This was their favorite way of putting down people who were rebels. And so, Right now, this would be like people wearing an electric chair around their neck. Okay, that, that's, that's the severity of what this is. But most of us don't see that. We just see an empty symbol. Listen to me. It, it's no wonder in a world full of tea necklaces, right, that there's this predominant question. Where is God in pain and suffering? We've forgotten the meaning of the cross, Jesus is the one who came and lived and died and suffered on our behalf. He entered into our suffering so that we could find life. We've forgotten the cross. Jesus promised a life full of purpose, not a life devoid of pain. Can anybody relate to that? Has anybody found that true in their life? So here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to look at four things. We're going to look at the cross. We're going to look at the cry. We're going to look at the curtain. And we're going to look at the covering. So number one, let's look at the cross. Matthew 27, 26, it says, Then he released for them Barabbas, having been scourged. Now this is beaten within an inch of his life with a cat of nine tails. They would have filleted his skin all the way open. Mo most historians said he would have had no skin on his back and you quite possibly could have seen his intestines. And they delivered him to be crucified. That's nailed to a cross. Uh, who in here has seen the movie Hook? Y'all seen Hook? Y'all remember that movie with Robin Williams? Come on, show of hands. You've seen Hook. Um, it is a Christmas movie, by the way. Fight me on that. Here's the basic premise of what happened in Hook. Uh, Peter Pan had gotten old, all right? Peter Pan, when we mostly think of him, he was young, and he could fly, and he could do all these amazing things. Well, Peter Pan had gotten old, he had gotten fat, and he had fully forgotten who he was. And then one day, his children were kidnapped, and they were kidnapped by the dastardly Captain Hook, right? And so Peter Pan, Tinkerbell comes to him and takes him to a place called Neverland. Everybody say Neverland. And he gets there and he has no idea what he is, all right? He, he thinks he's tripping, all right? He thinks he's gotten some, some drugs or something in his system, all right? He's seen all this crazy stuff. And he's confronted with Captain, Captain Hook. He's like, dude, I don't know who you are. And he was like, I'm here to finally fight you and vanquish you. And so he pulls out his checkbook, right? And he's like, how much money do you want? He does not understand the situation that he's in. And so what he says is, I think he gives him a week, and he says, you've got a week to go figure out who you are, and we're going to fight for the soul of Neverland. And so he goes in, and he goes with all these lost boys, and they, they quickly realize this is not the pan they remember, okay? He can't fly, he can't crow, he can't see imaginary food, all these different things. And so they start getting him in, in this training, and there, there's a character, and I wish this was not his name. I promise I thought of the analogy before I looked up the name. His name is Thudbutt. T-H-U-D-B-U-T-T, -T -T. Thudbutt. <laughs> and there's a character, Thudbutt, <laughs> and he goes to Peter Pan, and he says, you've forgotten. How could you forget? He'd forgotten where his power came from. Y'all, doesn't this happen to us? We've forgotten the power that's available to us in the cross. It's not some old relic. It's the power of God for salvation for men. How many of us, if we're honest, go through life with no spiritual power? We claim allegiance to the cross. We claim allegiance to the king who triumphed over the cross, but we have no spiritual power. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this. It says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But, for we, who, but we who are being saved know it to be the very power of God. I love the scene when Peter becomes Peter Pan again. And Thudbutt looks at him and goes, Peter, you remembered. And he can fly. And he can sword fight. And he can crow. And what's interesting is, and I love this parallel, 
he becomes joyful again. Like his whole face lights up and animates. He becomes kind. He got his power back. I wonder if any of us need that this morning. Like you're going through life, you've lost perspective, and and you've forgotten the power of the cross. This is what happens when we remember the power. Listen to me. Because Christ suffered and endured on the cross, our suffering now has meaning. Many people live for happiness. That is our world, right? That's the ethic of our world. Live for happiness, live for joy. If something doesn't make you happy, leave it. Like I literally saw a post the other day that said divorce is okay, right? Just period. No circumstances, just if you want to get divorced, leave. Listen, life is complicated. Some of you guys have gone through that. But we're in this place right now where it's like if something is difficult, leave. You You don't need that. The message of the cross is that life has meaning. Suffering has meaning. Pushing through suffering has meaning. The power of the cross is this, that God has endured suffering on our behalf so that our suffering would have meaning, enabling us not just to endure hardships, but to thrive in them. You know, I was reading something recently, and basically what it said is this, is that that Christians aren't just resilient. Everyone say resilient. We're actually anti-fragile, okay? When something's fragile, what does that mean? It breaks easily. When something's anti-fragile, it means that when it meets resistance or trials, it doesn't just stay as it is and stay static. It actually gets stronger. You know, one of the best testimonies of our lives is that as we go through suffering, we become more like the son of suffering. We become more like Jesus. More joy wells up in our lives. And, you know, our, our world takes notice when we suffer well. Look at these promises in the epistles. The reality of the cross enables us to keep going, carry on. Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. It it enables us not just to be resilient in pain, but grow stronger through it. Look at Romans 5, verse 3 through 4. It says, Not only so, but we also glory. Think about just how bizarre that is in our sufferings. Think about your sufferings. Do you glory in your sufferings? Because we know that suffering produces something in us. It produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And the next verse says that hope does not put us to shame. The endurance of Jesus enables us to become mature and complete. Do you long for spiritual maturity? Do you long to become complete in Christ? We have to learn how to embrace suffering the way that our, su- our Savior embraced suffering. Look at this, James 1, 2 through 4. It says, consider it pure joy. <laughs> what? Joy. When you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? So let perseverance finish its work so that you may become mature, lacking nothing being complete. Y'all, Fitz and I talked about this yesterday, wherever Fitz is. There he is. Uh, you know, the, the Navy SEALs. To become a Navy SEAL, you have to be the top 1% of the top 1%. You have to be somebody who is not just physically gifted, but can endure more pain than anybody else, and you keep trucking. Y'all, success in life, and take this to the bank, has much less to do with your talent than it has to do with your ability to endure pain and to keep going. You know, what the cross does for us is it gives us a context, a framework for our pain and saying, I'm not going to be overcome by this because Jesus was victorious over his pain. He's invited me. He's included me in that. So what pain are you enduring? I know so many of your stories, just looking around the room at friends, things that you're going through facing financial issues. You're facing the repercussions of bad decisions that you've made. You're facing health issues. Going through divorce. Get mental trauma in your life. So, so what pain are you enduring? And how are you enduring it? J- Jesus gave us a roadmap for this. It, it says, uh, the Apostle Paul said that it was for the joy set before him that he endured Jesus understand the purpose of his pain. He understood, that, he understood that, that life wasn't just about the platform you can create for yourself or the influence you can create for yourself or the happiness that you can create for yourself. 
but it's about finding meaning in life. When we have meaning and we know why we're doing the things that we're doing, we can endure so much more. So what's your meaning? What's your purpose? What are you aiming at? What are you building? Are you building God's kingdom through your workplaces, through the different things that you're doing? Are you building your own kingdom? Are you building something that's not going to last? You can build something that's eternal. Yo, having that lens absolutely transforms our suffering. Rebecca Shetswell posted this today. She's one of our pastors at Conway, and this is really long, but it's really good, and I'm going to read it all to you. And you have no choice but to sit there and listen. I guess you could leave. This is about Jesus. It says, he did not ask for the beatings to stop. He did not run or rage or fight back when his beard was torn from his face or his flesh was ripped from his back or his forehead pierced with poisonous thorns and his eyes caught the split, the spit of taunters. He did not push back when his broken body collapsed under the weight of a wooden cross laying upon cut flesh and exposed bone. The swelling, the pain, the piercing, the throbbing, the searing pain from every part of his body screaming for relief, for the blows to stop, and for the numbness to kick in. His body screamed, yet he remained silent. He did not curse, he did not threaten or moan, but he set his face like flint, and he endured the pain and the embarrassment as he hung naked and bleeding between two thieves. Insults continued from the ground. The soldiers, the leaders, and the onlookers continued to assault him with words. Wasn't death enough? Yet he hung, struggling for breath, listening to the abuse, the ridicule, and the accusations. He stayed the course. He interceded. He comforted. He even welcomed in a lost soul beside him. The all-powerful one restrained his power and silenced his voice to give himself over to a violent merciless, lonely death. This is the suffering. This is the work of Jesus. That's the cross. Let's look at the cry. Matthew 27, 46. It says, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt the pain of losing someone close to you? It, it, it could be a death in your family. It could be grieving the loss of friends. A lot of us have been through that. I, I remember when my, my grandmother died. She has Alzheimer's, and uh, my grandpa served her faithfully for the last 10 years of her life. When she'd forgotten who she was, she'd forgotten who everybody around her was. And he served her, y'all, with joy. One of the greatest testimonies of the love of Jesus I've ever seen. And if I can be transparent with y'all, I remember thinking when she was in hospice, Papa's going to have some relief, right? Papa's put so much work into this. He's going to have some relief. Like, he loves his wife, but, I mean, this is just crushing. But he loved her. Something I miss is just how much he loved his wife. And when she died, that grief, it just, just changed him. And I remember sitting across from him one day, and he wasn't laughing like he used to. He wasn't cracking jokes and picking on me like he did my entire life. And I said, Papa... Let's go out and do something you love and you enjoy. He said, Bronson, we could do that. But he said, when you lose her one day, if you lose her first one day, pointing at Callie, he said, you're going to know how this feels. And it wasn't six months later he followed her. He, 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 he had a broken heart. He, he was grieving. You know, when Jesus cries out, that's better translated shrieked, like he screamed, like it was excruciating pain. This was the moment that our sin came upon him and his father turned his face away. He had been in perfect relationship with God from the beginning of time. Perfect, yielding, fulfilling relationship. And in that moment, he became all of our sin. He became our rage as humanity. He became our anger. He became our lust. He became our pride. He became our selfishness. And his father turned his face away. Why? Because God cannot look upon sin. He can't interact with it. 
the father turned away and he withdrew from him and his grief was unimaginable. You know, they did a range of studies to reveal the powerful effects that grief can have on the body. It increases inflammation, which can worsen health problems if you already have ones or cause new ones. It batters the immune system, leaving you depleted and vulnerable to infection. The heartbreak of grief can increase blood pressure and the risk of blood clots, but this is the one I want you to notice. Intense grief can alter the heart muscle, so much so that it causes broken heart syndrome. It's a form of heart disease with the same symptoms of a heart attack. Jesus died of a broken heart. He had the physical pain of the cross, but the relational agony, I would contend, of not having that connection with his father, what was more painful for him? Listen, this is the gospel. Jesus was separated from God and his heart was broken so that we can be connected to God and be made whole. This is why he cried out. The Father abandoned him so that we could be accepted. You know, it's interesting. If you just look philosophically, it's a side note. If you're creating a religion, you don't make the hero die naked and screaming, right? You just don't do that. If you look at Buddhism or any other religion, the founders died peacefully with words of wisdom. But here's Jesus screeching naked on the cross, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what Jesus endured so that we could have life. Okay, let's look at the second half. So we looked at the cross and we looked at the cry. That's the pain of Jesus. Now let's look at what he did for us. This is the curtain. Point number three, Matthew 27, 51 through 53. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split, and the tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who'd fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Men, I'll talk to you for a second. Have you ever taken your wife on a date? And she's like, this is the date to end all dates. I don't need another date, ever. I am fully satisfied and how perfect this date was. Or have you ever had a conversation with your wife, or your girlfriend, or whatever, and they're like, this is the conversation to end all conversations. I have no more need for more conversation from you. I am fully satisfied. Show of hands, anybody figured that out yet? Never, right? This is why lines like you had me at hello, I find myself in you, it's fantasy, right? We cannot become, if we're honest, fully satisfied in another person. We can't do it. Okay, think about the, the needs that we have relationally, all that different type of stuff. It's deep within us. It's, it's a core truth. It's an innate value that we have. It's something we have as human beings. Now, now think about the nature of God. God is perfectly holy from the beginning of time. And he has absolute rage and wrath for sin. Why? Let's unpack this for a second. Why, why would he hate sin so much? It's destroyed his creation. Think about the effects, the ripple effects in our world. Not just the hurricanes and the tornadoes and all those other results of brokenness and fallenness and famine, but wars. Think about just in your own life, the way we treat each other. Jesus, God, excuse me, Father God hates brokenness. He hates it so much he can't even look upon it. But yet, the gospel is that Jesus, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross fully satisfied. Just try, try to just take a moment. Think about how much you love your family and how much rage you have, anger, wrath, when someone hurts your family. Now just imagine, God views the entire world as his family. There's this wrath, this justice. Y'all, here, here's a problem we have. I didn't get to get to this last week, so I'm gonna sprinkle it in tonight. We long for justice, but we're diametrically opposed to judgment, right? You cannot have justice without judgment. 
if, if someone is hurting someone else and you want justice for that person, there has to be judgment. But how often do we say, oh, I don't believe in a God of wrath and judgment. That's Old Testament, right? We do believe in a God of wrath and judgment because we believe in a God of justice. The justice and the wrath of God, this is the gospel, this is the good news, was poured out fully on Jesus so that we wouldn't have to come under the wrath and the judgment of God. Y'all, that is the offer on the table. We're going to talk about more of that at Easter. But y'all, here's what happened. The curtain. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The curtain was 60 feet tall by 20 feet wide by four inches thick. Okay, this is the temple veil. In the moment that Jesus breathed his last, that curtain was ripped from top to bottom. What does that mean? The place that previously, if you entered with imperfections, the wrath of God came on you and you dropped dead. It was a terrifying place, okay? People didn't think the Holy of Holies like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to waltz in there. I can't wait to spend some time with God. I'm going to do my quiet time in the Holy of Holies this morning. This place of absolute terror, this place of absolute holiness because of the work of Jesus became available to sinful people like you and me. Jesus died in pain so that we could enter into the presence of God. And the brokenness that was from the garden, from the beginning, was healed. God invited us back into perfect relationship with himself. Jesus was separated from God so that we could be connected to God. The covering. We're going to close with this. Um, so we have the cross, that's the physical pain of Jesus. We have the cry, that's the emotional, relational pain of Jesus. We have the curtain, that's the access that Jesus gave us. And now we're going to look at the covering. I, this, I've never noticed this before. This past week when I was studying and reading, Matthew 27, 15 through, actually it's 25 through 26. Here's what it says. This is when they're asking for Barabbas instead of Jesus. All the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. And then they released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus to be crucified. You all think about how much you would have to hate someone or how sure you'd have to be that somebody was wrong for you to say, don't just let his blood be on us. Don't just let his guilt be on me. Put it on my children. Just enter into that. I read somebody say once that Jesus died at the hands of envious men so that he could deliver men from envy. You know, th these are people who envy Jesus. They hated Jesus. And they invited a curse on their children because of this man. If they were wrong, let there be a curse on them. But he here's the miracle of grace. His blood is on them. Not as blood of a curse, but a blood, the blood of a new covenant, a new promise from God. God is so good and God is so gracious that when we murder him and we say let him, his guilt be upon us, God put our guilt on him so that we could walk in the covering and in the promise and in the grace of God. Yo, that is the good news of the gospel. That is what Jesus has done for us. Not the blood of a curse, but the blood of a covenant. Not the blood of his divine wrath, but the blood of his divine mercy. Those who were his enemies are the very ones he came to save. Yo, why you were an enemy of God. Jesus was spat upon. He was beaten and he was nailed to a tree because he loves you so much. And he desperately desires a relationship with us. That's what we're going to talk about more on Sunday. The gospel is that we don't take on guilt. We take on grace. So when we look at the cross tonight, we're about to close. What we see is not Jesus' failure, but his faithfulness. We don't see him losing. We see him loving. He loved us so much that he was faithful to God's mission and he died for us. He absorbed the penalty for our sins so that we could stand before God completely justified and declared righteous in his sight. So here's the question. If all of this is true and you're a Jesus follower, 
How are you suffering right now? How are you suffering with him? Are you suffering as somebody who has hope? Somebody who's being strengthened? Are you being torn down by the suffering? Are you walking? Do you remember the power of the cross? Be honest. I I was talking to Fitz again earlier. We have a lot of conversations. You know what one of the ways that we suffer is? We endure temptation. Does it ever feel good to deny yourself in the moment? (laughs) Never, right? It always feels good to give in. Y'all, one of the ways that we suffer with Christ, we battle our sin, we fight, we war so that we can become like him. Y'all, that's the type of Christians our world needs. People who know how to battle, people who know how to suffer. And here's my challenge to you tonight. I know you came in expecting an Easter message and you got a Good Friday message and now you got a challenge. Let's suffer well together for the gospel and build the kingdom of Jesus so that other people who are broken, who are lost, who are far from God can come under the covenant of his grace and his mercy and learn how to do the same because suffering is a guarantee in this life. But you don't have to go through it alone. You don't have to go through it bound by weakness, but we can go through it covered by grace and with the strength of Jesus. Amen. And so stand to your feet all across the room. We're going to take some time. We're going to respond. I want to ask you two questions. God, what are you speaking to me? Just take a moment. Ask that question. God, what are you speaking to me? Okay, then I've got a question for you. If he's speaking to you about something, he wants you to adjust on something. What are you going to do about it? For some of you guys, that might look like bringing somebody else in on your suffering. It might look like telling somebody else what's going on. It might look like getting back in the fight. It might look like not fighting alone, like actually bringing God in on what you're going through. I want to read this quote from Tim Keller because I always give you a quote from Tim Keller. We'll end with this. It says, while other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrow. Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of the world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. What does that mean? While the joys, while the world's saying like, we're gonna sit in this joy, we're gonna rest in this because we know life's gonna be difficult later. Our worldview is that we can sit in sorrow right now because we know the joy that's set before us. We know that God has eternity in his hands. We know that our suffering is in this life alone and in the life to come, in the kingdom promised by Jesus, the new heavens and the new earth where there are no tears, there are no weeping. There is just fullness of relationship for all of time, fullness of connection with God. Imagine that. We can endure a little bit of suffering, right? Because we know what God has for us. Amen. Let me pray for you. And uh, we're going to go into a time of response. God, I thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the cross. Right now, we just remember the cross and we live in the tension of it. Lord, we ask that you would help us be a people who know how to suffer. God, who know how to go through things. And God, that you'd bring us strength. And that's why I pray for anybody in here. As you're going through that, you're like, I don't have that power. I don't have access to that. I have never had access access to that in my relationship with Jesus. Y'all, in one moment, that can entirely change. And so if that's you, I just want you to hold your hands out in front of you. Nobody's looking around. It's just me, you, and God. I'm going to pray for you. God, I pray for that person right now who wants that power. God, we thank you that the word says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead rests in us and lives in us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would rush in and that you'd fill them. God, we thank you that you have a plan for them. The enemy had a plan for them, but now, God, they're getting on your plan. They're getting on your ways. They're going to do things the way that you want them to be done. And they're going to walk in victory and joy, and they're going to endure in Jesus' name. Everybody said...